cheaper than our producer's underage sister. Edgier than the stuff shown on late night television. Newer than Kim Kardashian's ex. Live from Orlando, it's Crazy Train Radio. This is Lex Luger, Total Package, former World Heavyweight Wrestling Champion, and you are listening to the Crazy Train Radio Station. This next guest has overcome both physical, mental, and so many challenges over his life to bring him to this very rewarding stage currently. His new book, which is out now on Amazon, and all local bookstores, Wrestling with the Devil, tells the tale of a man who's been through the highest of highs and lowest of lows, both career-wise and personally. Uh, the book is actually, actually covers an all-inspiring look at all this stuff. Right now on the phone, the author of Wrestling with the Devil, Lex Luger. Lex, what's going on? Hey, guys. Great to be on. Thanks for having me. Good. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm in the uh, Big Apple touring around. I love it. Yeah, that actually, because uh, he mentions that, uh, today is actually, we're recording this before his uh, signing in, uh, in Ridgewood, New Jersey. So, are you expecting a big crowd for that, Lex? Well, we're always hopeful. You never know until you show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the, first of all, before we get into it, what's the response been for the book so far? What has been the response? Yeah, what what kind of response have you heard so far? Because it's only been out a couple so of days. I've had a very, I think the main theme or comment I've got back from it, well, number one, that, that, that they were the honest, the, the depth of, of uh, that I went into everything. I didn't leave anything out. I, just, I didn't skip over anything topically, good or bad, like you said in the intro and that it was dealt with honestly from my perspective, and that um, most people um, felt that they came out with a very uplifting feeling. So they thought it was a quick read, that they, they got through it quickly in a good way, and that it, it, it kept them wanting to read it, and that they uh, definitely enjoyed it acting on a positive note. Okay. Well, obviously... Of course, they're talking to me, so of course they tell me they liked it. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you what. Uh, your guys over at the publisher sent me actually a copy to read back in end of May, beginning of June. So I actually been through it a couple of times and definitely found it to be a decent read for sure. And oh, did wow. Find you to be an early version. Yeah, and I did find it to be a very open and honest, like you said. But uh, first and foremost, I want to ask you that I read. And obviously it was known a couple of years ago. How was your health? Because for those who don't know, uh, Lex had a uh, spinal stroke a couple of years ago. Yeah, my health is excellent. Uh, my spinal cord was, well, the initial diagnosis and prognosis was basically 0 to 5% chance from all the top neurologists on the planet to have any movement from the neck to the neck. I wouldn't be able to feed myself. I'd need 24-hour care. I'd need to be bathed, clothed. So to be able to live on my own drive, um, most of the days, I, I have, I have most of my challenging days, I'm able to walk and get around and do, I haven't had 100% restoration yet neurologically, but I've gotten so much back against what the doctors thought I ever could get. Uh, I'm very thankful for that. And my, actually, my blood pressure, my heart, my, I mean, everything is just bad, but my health is just phenomenal. Thank you for asking well, honestly, uh, for someone who was so physical and very active for most of your life, you played college football, you went into pro football a little bit, wrestled. Uh, how much of a shock was that for you to go from so active to not really to that scare? Yeah, it was a huge adjustment. It was a real shock at first, but 
um, I found that uh, God's much more interested in my long-term care development than my short-term comfort. <laughs> so it's been a real uh, – it's the adversity that my spinal cord injury presented me with was very challenging. My friends, my faith, everything was challenged, but uh, it brought me through and strengthened it. And I feel I'm a much stronger person now from the inside out, not from the outside anymore, but from the inside out. And I'm, I'm really it's turned out to be a blessing rather than a, a tragedy. So I'm, I'm just, uh, it's actually been a, a, a very positive experience for me. It gave me empathy for, I never had any empathy for others who struggle physically. It's just a whole new world for me, really. So it's really been a, overall a positive experience. Yeah, it's definitely a learning lesson, that's for sure. Uh, and obviously you go into that, uh, the beginning stages of that within the book here, Wrestling with the Devil. Uh, but let's jump back into the book a little bit, because we obviously want fans to go out and buy the book. Uh, what first led you to go and write a book? Was it something you wanted to do, or did somebody else come to you and say, hey, you got an interesting story, let's write this? <laughs> yeah, the latter. I definitely wasn't something I intended to ever do. I really thought I never would. I was a guy who um, had trouble finishing a two-page essay in school. So just everything lined up. All my uh, friends and mentors and people who have been in my life said, Lex, you, you should really get your story out there for people to read and encourage them. And with your struggles, whether it's with addictions or or with when they think things are, they've lost hope that your story can be encouraging to them and you should put it out there. Just the, the publishing company that came forward, that one of these great Tyndale, they all, I don't know if you know the football coach Tony Dungy, they've done all of his stuff. I met his, his uh, literary agent, he represented me, and just the doors that were open made it clear that I should go ahead and just be obedient and go along with the, with the group that thought I should do it, so. Rather than be a hindrance, I went ahead and did it, and I'm just thrilled with the way it's in the house, the man who friend of mine helped me write it. What turned out, I'm very, I'm very, very pleased with how it turned out. Well, when writing the book, obviously, when they got a chance to see it, did your ex-wife or your kids or anybody, personal, friends, family, whatever, uh, give you any flack for uh, what you told in the book? Um, I can't speak for how they feel about it. But there was definitely, um, from my family, some resistance to the book being done because obviously you're going to be bringing things out. A lot of my family really felt that why would you go back and talk about all that and then put it in a book? Why don't you just move on with your life and leave it alone? If I had to do a general consensus among my family. But... My faith, the faith-based segment of my life that means so much to me said, we know your family doesn't want you to do this, but as far as getting the word out and sharing the good news of what God's done in your life, you, you really need to do this. So I yeah, had to back it all in, and I had to really think it over and pray about it. I, I came to the conclusion that I needed to move forward with the book. It was not It was not an easy decision. And most of my family was definitely not in favor of it. But obviously, like you said, you had to pray about it. You think about it. Uh, talk to the ones you're close to, and obviously, thought you make the right decision, which is an interesting reading. But if we could spend a few minutes, let's uh, talk about your career, both football and wrestling. Uh, well, first of all, with the wrestling, did you have any interest, or did you watch the sport as a kid? I didn't. I watched, uh, we we had it on the locker room once in a while. I was a football player, and we'd laugh, and we thought it was fun. And we we we, we were, I guess you'd call it casual observers of wrestling. We thought it was it was fun to watch, but I was never to have it like weekly. Didn't grow up watching. I didn't watch it like on a weekly, regular basis or anything like that. No, you are correct. Okay. Well, obviously, uh, which may, most people know you from, as, from football at least, that you went and played at the University of Miami, which you ended up getting uh, asked to leave, we'll, we'll put it that way. But your freshman year, you were actually on scholarship at Penn State University. Uh, yes. Go into that a little in-depth. 
but obviously in the past year to two years here, obviously there's been a lot that's going on at, at Penn State. But for someone like yourself yes. that spent time up there, what did you think of uh, Joe Pa's uh, reputation getting ahead and everything that's going up there, on up there? Yeah, it was a real, it was very unfortunate, a real tragedy, especially most of all for the victims. Who would have ever thought? He, uh, Sandusky was the office, was a, de- I'm sorry, defensive coordinator when I was there. A very well-liked coach, and none of us had a hint there was anything uh, going on with the guy like that, obviously. Um, it was shocking to me. I wasn't shocked that something like that could have potentially been sort of put on the back burner as far as a cover-up or else not trying to bring it into the proper light because it's a big-time campus, big-time football program, and a very small town. So when you have that combination, I think sometimes the powers that be, just it's just my opinion, feel like maybe they can, maybe the benefit of their reputation of the school and the football program, sort of work this thing through without a, uh, hitting the big time, big like big time pressure. Some of that might have gone on, unfortunately. But yeah. Uh- for an unfortunate circumstance uh, and everything, you move along and you go into the CFL with uh, both Montreal and uh, what was your experience in Montreal like? Oh, it was wonderful. Are you kidding me? I was a 19 and 20 year old, 21 year old, those those couple years there, uh, loose and fancy free. I was a, a credible city, uh, uh, food, uh, women, you name it. It was It was incredible. I had a great time up there. Uh, okay. Now, obviously, not many people realize it, and they don't even acknowledge it, even though you were injured, that you actually spent the 1982 season with one of my favorite teams personally, the Green Bay Packers. Now, in the I book, did. I went can, there and – I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, which is another hint to, for people to check out the book was, because you talked about it in depth, was in your time with the Packers, uh, some of the coaches said you would never amount to anything. What can you say about Green Bay? Yeah, uh, Green Bay, I, I had a uh, – I and they had very high hopes. I was projected to be their starting – a starter for them the year I came in. And I got injured in camp and just never was able to, to – even the following year in 83, I spent the a training camp with them there as well. I just didn't feel like my the coach staff I had there things were going to work out. So I looked for green pastures down in the USFL with Steve Spurrier and Tampa Bay Bandits. It turned out to be a good move. Well, not long after yeah, your I time in the USFL, the injury was a unfortunate. Sorry story. about that. Yeah. Uh, but your time with the USFL, you start to transition uh, and start training for professional wrestling. How much of a difference physically was it to go from football to wrestling? Well, they're both very physically demanding and they evolve. You know, it's, it's not for the faint heart. Um, all those slam duplexes are very physically demanding. You get injured, you're sore, you ache. Still when playing football. Um, the regimen that Hiro Matsuda, who broke me in, very thankful for, we broke a lot of the top ten, like Mr. Wonderful and Paul Kogan. I was just so fortunate to have a mentor and a man like that in my life. He took me into the dungeon for about three months. So i would never been through a torture process like that with push-ups and hinge squats and running in the heat of the day. And he turned the air conditioning off in Tampa. It would be 115 degrees in there. So that was a, that was definitely a new experience for me. With Hero Matt Spirit, but very, very rewarding at the same time, if that makes sense. Well, obviously, because you mentioned your trainer's name, Hiro Matsuda, uh, and he's trained so many people. Uh, but with you in particular, when reading your story, was he actually went out on the road with you as a manager. Uh, how much of a learning experience was that for him to actually physically be there at shows with you early on? Well, I think, first of all, he was there because he was so scared I was going to mess up. <laughs> so he wanted he wanted to be ringside. It's, it's part of our special relationship him and I had. And he uh, he really wanted to make sure everything went well. My, my matches my first few months, I was so new to the wrestling. 
and he'd go ringside like as my manager. He had never done that before. We showed how much, how special our relationship was. And I'm so, I'm so appreciative of that. He was a, just a wonderful man. Yeah, definitely for sure. Well, early on in Florida and into your uh, transition into uh, the Crockett and WCW, you definitely worked a lot with a lot of greats. Barry Windham, the great Moody. What can you tell us uh, without giving away too much from what's in the book about those experiences? Oh, I had a great. You're talking about the guys I got to work with? Yeah. Oh, man, I worked with uh, probably in my era every guy you could name uh, throughout my career, starting with Horseman and the opportunity to work with Ric Flair, who was uh, another instrumental key to me becoming what I did in wrestling, meaning what, what I did over my 15-year career. Couldn't have had a better in-ring mentor than Ric Flair. Just He's a star maker. People don't – he's underestimated for that. He was not only a star himself, but he was a expert – being a star maker or staying myself, he was a, a key. I don't think we would have been what we were in the business if it wasn't for Ric Flair. Um, working with Aaron and Tully and J.J., that was an incredible time. Uh, just a uh, special time with Slam Yokozuna on the Intrepid here in New York in the harbor on July 4th, back in 93. Um, uh, the upset of Hogan on Monday Night Pro for the world title. He never ever lost on television in his whole career. That was a a huge upset and uh, another high point. Just I got to work with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels and you name a guy now, Undertakers and you name a Sting. He's a great yeah. friend. I got to. And I mean, well, you name a top guy from my era. I got to work with them or get in and and just uh, very very. Uh, I, you really couldn't even pick out one guy. They all they all meant a lot and were were, were wonderful to work with. I, I well, say the book, I'm, I'm very careful to note that wrestling wasn't the problem in my life. It was what I did outside of wrestling. Wrestling and the fans, phenomenal. The traveling all over the world and meeting people and, and the pay-per-views and the excitement. Wrestling was phenomenal for 15 years. It was the thing I did outside of the ring, really, that, that caused my life to be a train wreck in the scenes, not wrestling. Wrestling was phenomenal. Well, obviously, you mentioned the a very key guy in your life there in that list of some of the talent you worked with who actually wrote the, a very nice foreword for your book, Steve Borden, Sting. How yeah. close are you guys? What can you say about the guy that most people wouldn't think about? Yeah, I was at his induction into the TNA Hall of Fame. They asked me to speak about our friendship. and In about 10 minutes, it's hard to sum up. A friend is a friend who loves at all times. He's been there for me through thick and thin, even though I didn't deserve it. He never lost hope of me, even when I had many times given up, probably on myself. Uh, he's a very, very special friend, uh, both in wrestling early in our careers and out of the ring. And to this moment that we speak, he's a, he's a very, very uh, special guy. Yeah, you uh, mentioned uh, there, and you meant, I should say, you mentioned in the book very in-depth of, and as you mentioned there as well, that he was there for you when you didn't want to be bothered, so to say, in some of your dark times. But yes, yes he stood there, like you said, as a, fr a friend is a friend is a friend. For sure. He is. He epitomizes but, uh, that. Great guy. But, obviously, we know you got the signing Ridgewood uh, tonight. So, uh, what kind of other signings do you got going on for the book promotion right now? Um, they have a schedule for me. I, mean, I take things, I'm not like a day to time guy these days. <laughs> but, so I couldn't, I have to, I have to look at my, uh, at my smartphone to get to where I'm at next. I think I'm in, I think I'm in Spartanburg, South Carolina on, uh, Thursday night for a signing and, and a talk. Yeah. But, yeah, after pretty that, much man, I'm years sure ago. <laughs> yeah, I know I got something for... about these guys. Well, I haven't met yet. The Duck Dynasty guys, I got something with them uh, in September somewhere in Rome, Georgia. <laughs> well, speaking of Duck Dynasty, I mean, that'll be you fun to meet those guys. I hear they're, I've never seen their show, but I heard they're wildly popular. Yes, yes. Uh, we, I met some of those guys at a function we covered last year uh, down here in Atlanta or Orlando, that's for sure. And Yeah, yeah that's should be fun and interesting uh, a native New Yorker like me hanging out with Duck Dynasty guys. 
Oh, I'll tell you what. Yeah, just picture, as I was telling some people off there, some of our new interns. We had uh, the guys from Duck Dynasty, Billy Gunn, Larry the Cable Guy. Talk about an interesting crew there. <laughs> I know. Yep. I'm not a, like a hunter, an outdoorsman guy. I tell people throughout my lifetime, just staying in a hotel without, without room service was roughing it for me. I, I never thought about uh, outdoor stuff and, and sleeping in tents and stuff. Never never appealed to me. <laughs> uh, well, as speaking of, uh, like you said right there, with a uh, hotel with wrestling and all, because if you want to see an outdoor or wild weekend, go to the Hojo's up in North Jersey with uh, some of the guys at the WWF that Bobby Heenan mentions. Oh, yeah. So, wild times back in the day. Obviously, the book is Wrestling with the Devil. Lex Luger, thank you so much for taking a few minutes. Guys, thanks for having me on. You guys have a wonderful day. <laughs>